Let's take a look at the Kaleidoscape operational menus and, and setup and configuration details for if you have one of these players, what are the options that you have, how do you configure it, and such to make it work in conjunction with the rest of your AV system. So I will kind of break this into two parts. In this part, I want to go over configuration menus, settings, config, options, technical kind of setup details and such for the system. I will do a separate video where we actually go over the, the UI elements and the, oper the operational aspects and kind of workflow of, of navigating the UI and the options and capabilities and such you have in there. So focusing then on technical setup and config, Kaleidoscape uh, setup is really broken kind of into two pieces. There's a set of options and, and, and settings and such that you actually do on the player itself. And then there's other elements of the system and, and its configuration, and including some of the more technical details that you actually set up via like a web UI accessed through, through a browser. So we're gonna take a look at both of those in this video. We'll start with the on-device settings and then we'll migrate into the web view for the more technical stuff. All right, so let's take a look at the on-device settings, options, configuration, and such first. Uh, just to provide some background, this is the new Kaleidoscape hardware that I recently purchased and, and made the overview and hands-on videos for the channel. We're talking here about a Strato C player being fed from a compact Terra 12 terabyte server, all installed nicely in my rack. I am in my living room, so we're seeing this on my Sony 85 inch X900H television. The way I run my Kaleidoscape system and really all my sources right now is I have a main zone, zone two setup, and so I can access uh, any of my sources in either zone. And just for lighting and, and such, it's easier to, to do the recording off of the TV. So what we're looking at here is the main Kaleidoscape UI. These are all the movies that I have downloaded to my system right now. I think I've got that 12 terabyte about half full. Um, at the moment, I wanted to upgrade from the, to the 12 from the 6 to give me a little bit more space, uh, even though my Kaleidoscape library is much larger than, than even 12 terabytes will hold by a good bit. But in any case, this is the main movie wall, probably what most folks are used to seeing. So if we go into the menus, we can see it starts here with a couple sections. Uh, sorry for the glare, but we have the main section for my movies and library access. We have the store, we have parental control. And then what we want to focus on in this video is we have the system area. Now I will go over the general movie playback, library interface, operate all of those other pieces in another video. Again, I want this one to be focused essentially on the core elements of system configuration, settings, and that. So under system, we have two areas, uh, one for status, which gives us a couple of different summaries here. One is a content summary. And as you can see, I actually have 84 movies uh, loaded on the system right now. That represents all the storage available in my setup, which of course is just the one 12 terabyte compact Terra. No downloads are in progress. And then in terms of available storage with 84 movies loaded, I have enough room in an estimated fashion to hold 91 more uh, 4K HDR movies, about 168 HD movies and 930 SD movies. So if you're curious about capacity, there's some real numbers and you can do the math depending on you know how many movies you may have, how much storage you may have or would be considering and what things might hold. And again, this is for a 12 terabyte of, of storage unit. System summary tells us a couple of different details, right? The system name, I just called mine home, current time, current software version, and when it was last upgraded, I like that. And one of the things about the KOS versions is that Kaleidoscape generally does share details. Uh, it's like patch notes, release notes. They're not available on the device, but because of their engagement at the Kscape owners forum, there generally is postings there of things to look for um, and items of change, uh, bugs fixed and whatnot in the different KOS versions. So I appreciate that they share that information there. Uh, details on the last service connection. Of course, this is a live service device. You're downloading movies from Kaleidoscape. And so it reaches out to the server every once in a while, pings for updates, pings for new content. 
and, and so on. Um, of course, then serial number, IP address, MAC addresses, and all that. And then lastly, a downloads tab. This would show me um, if I had something currently downloaded, what I would be downloading. And I do have the option to set a maximum download speed if I wanted to, basically in 100 megabit per second increments. Of course, I leave mine in unlimited. I want the fastest downloads that I can possibly get. If we go down to the actual settings tab, we can see there's there's a, a fair number of options here. And these are kind of more operational characteristics, some interface characteristics and such. And as you'll see again, it's not the, the deeper technical settings. Those are done in the web UI, and we will take a look at that. So in terms of player options, you can elect to turn on a screensaver with a, a couple of different timing options, 2, 5, 15, and 30 minutes. Uh, I don't do a screensaver. Generally speaking, I turn my, my display devices and my zones off when I'm done using them. And so I, I'm not concerned about uh, any screen burn-ins or there's really no reason that in my setup and environment that I ever really elect to use screensavers. So I just have that disabled, but it's available if you want it. And like a lot of devices nowadays, there are two uh, types of power states that you can basically lock the player, lock the system into. When it's not in use, you can see here we have standby or more of a full power down, and it gives us some power details, 11 watts for standby, 0.35 watts for power down. Quite a bit of a difference, but the, the main difference is if you want to be able to have the certain aspects of IP control for power up, power down, and capabilities like that, then obviously you need to use kind of the network connected standby mode. That's what I use. I use a control four system to interface with this most of the time. And so my control four system needs to be able to power up and down the player. And, and I wanna be able to push downloads to it from, not just from the UI, but from the web or from the app and, and other places as well. I'm actually controlling this right now with my uh, control four uh, Neo remote. Under network, we have options here to change the network settings. This is the network address of the Strato player itself. Note, of course, the Strato C and the Terra will both have different, they're, they're individual devices on your network. They will have individual IP addresses and you can opt as usual for DHCP or static. I use static because um, that's that's really necessary for uh, consistently addressing the device, uh, consistently addressing the device on the same IP address for network-based control. And of course, this player is wired uh, Ethernet operation only. There's no Wi-Fi, so you don't see any type of uh, SSID or Wi-Fi setup there. So you can name uh, name your devices. Of course, I, I called this K Strato. I called my Terra K Terra. That's the name that it will show up with in different parts of the Kaleidoscape system configuration areas uh, on the network and that sort of thing. You can also name it basically for a zone. I think which is probably more common, and people would do that if if you have maybe multiple Strato Cs serving different locations in your household. I just have the one, and so I named it. So I named it for what it is. All right, next option here is language and subtitle control. And so this is more discrete playback settings. You can opt to basically use movie defaults or you know, opt to uh, some other language or, or native language, depending on uh, your, your preferences. Um, I'm a native English speaker. I generally prefer to watch or listen to English audio tracks or and see course requisite um, English subtitles when necessary. So I have my settings option uh, defaulted here toward English. If you are interested in another language, you can come in here and search. I don't know how uh, what, what the full range of languages and such is on the platform. Uh, if, if you're interested in that, I guess you could go to Kaleidoscape's webpage for more information. I, I don't know how many regions and such they cover specifically. Uh, passcode for parental controls. You can set your system to require a passcode before deleting content, changing levels, accessing the browser, or doing certain systems. Um, I'm not at the point where I'm concerned about my kids really messing with anything uh, on the system itself, so I don't bother to set a passcode, but you are able to protect 
certain system operations and such if you so choose, as well as uh, parental control for uh, different types of uh, movie content based on such on their ratings. So changing the parental control level allows you to kind of go up and down through these different settings here. I have mine uh, set to show all movies. I'm, I'm probably getting close to the point where maybe we need to start obscuring access to some, some stuff that our kids might show, but honestly, my kids don't just kind of wander their way into the theater uh, or, or using screens and, and such without some supervision or whatnot. So I just leave it set to show all movies and I don't have it specifically locked down. But there is a lot of provisioning in the system for this type of control, for protecting the operation, protecting what content is accessed. Um, historically, they've even offered a special remote for really uh, like younger kids that automatically kind of puts the system into a kid's mode and gives them more, more of a restricted content and a simpler interface. So over the years, Kaleidoscape has done a lot or tried to focus a lot on, on thoughtfulness and feature design uh, for parental type of aspects. All right, we have another tab here for advanced options. And so one of them has to do with uh, what they call calibration and testing, right? For calibrating touch panels and testing masking. So there's a whole lot of detailed home automation integration available in the Kaleidoscape platform. Um, I can't speak to specifically what these settings do is I don't use them. I don't have any control for um, specific touchpad or touch panel operations that I've ever tried to use this with. I use the Control 4 apps, I use the Kaleidoscape app, I use my Neo remotes, nor do I actually have a masking system. I do, however, use this option, the subtitle repositioning, and I really appreciate this setting. So you, you can see the two options available there. Um, I run the always reposition subtitles within the movie image. So I have a scope screen and I do different zooming uh, installation modes essentially for 16.9 content versus 235 or 240 type content. And so when I do zoom in and I put the bottom of the scope image at the bottom of the screen, it wouldn't work in my setup if the subtitles that were necessary to watch a given movie, alien language or four subs and whatever, were appearing below the movie image because they'd be down on my curtains and such underneath the screen. And so I always want subtitles to be within the movie image. And there's a setting available for that, as well as an option to reset player to factory defaults uh, if you needed to do so. And that will reset options that we see here, as well as configured options that are in the more technical menus of the web UI. Just a couple more here. Time zone, of course, uh, set it locally for wherever you're at on Eastern time. And then another kind of operational characteristic that plays into how your movies are presented on the movie wall. And you have two options, shuffle covers automatically to bring similar movies together. This is really a cornerstone of the whole Kaleidoscape UI. And I think one of their maybe even like patented UI options that they've created. Quite honestly though, I don't use it. I like my stuff presented in alphabetical order and there are still provisions with the remotes and such to be able to force a shuffle, I believe, even if you're in the alphabetical mode, but I, I, I rarely use the shuffle. I, I, with, with limited storage, I always pretty have a good idea like what, what I have on my system at a given time. I keep things loaded on it that I would expect myself or the family to want to choose from. And so there's not usually a lot of movie discovery for us that happens on the screen. But if I were to show this really quick and I go to covers, again, if you notice, I'm in alphabetical order here. So we start with A, on to B, on to C, D, and so on from there. If I go back to the settings and I flip this to shuffle, now let's go back to the movie cover wall. And I go to a movie, let's go down to Spider-Man and I wait a moment, there's the shuffle. So what Kaleidoscape is doing is basically keying off the currently selected thing and trying to determine, okay, what, 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 other, what other things that are available to watch on the system, right, are like this thing in some way. And I don't know all the details and such of their algorithm, but I do have a, a number of Star Wars movies loaded. So if I go to Star Wars, 
we should see it shuffle and, and load some more Star Wars around here. We got, I guess we got Solo, but we didn't get get all of the other Star Wars movies. Let's try Spider-Man. I have Amazing Spider-Man 1 and 2 currently loaded on the system. I would expect that we should see you know, Amazing Spider-Man number 2 kind of put right next to it. Let's go to Black Widow. I think I've got three or four Marvel Universe movies currently loaded. Let's see if we see. There's Eternals. There's some other superhero movies. So you can get an idea for how this works. Generally speaking, we make our movie picks ahead of time before we go downstairs or before we fire the theater up. So generally speaking, we know what we want to watch. And in that case, I find it incredibly easier to just leave it alphabetical because when you know what you're looking for, it's easier to find it by alphabetical order. If you use the shuffle and you're looking for something specific, there are some other ways, some other views to get to it, but getting to it very discreetly uh, on the movie wall when you have the shuffle mode set up uh, can sometimes be a challenge. Um, setup videos. There are some setup and calibration videos available through the storefront. Of course, you can get to them through there. And then as mentioned, right, other settings, audio and video settings, linking of components, and, and some of the more advanced and technical aspects of the system are not done on the device. They're done through the web UI and you access that through the IP address of the system. So let's pull this down and let's jump over to a web browser and take a look at those capabilities and configurations. Okay, so let's take a look at the web UI options and settings and such of the Kaleidoscape system. Now I'm using my MacBook Pro 16 inch M1 Pro here and I am running the web page in uh, just Safari. So I've navigated to the IP address of my player slash components like the, the on-device um, interface recommended. And we can see here that we start with the settings page. So we have a fairly, uh, a fairly simple uh, web server. It looks nice with three sections uh, here, movies, history, um, and settings. Let's jump across the, the other ones first just to get an idea. So movies, now this is all of the movies that are actually downloaded and available in my system right now. So you can see the correlation. We had 84 movies represented in the on-device summary UI, and I have the same 84 movies represented here. I can do some neat things like create movie collections, and I can do some management such as uh, deleting. If I check uh, certain movies specifically and I go to the bottom, I can, I can add things to collections. To There's some preset collections I can make my own. I can delete them. I can view a printable version of my movies or download it if you wanted to, say, for example, take an inventory uh, of what you have on the given system. And we can see here that we are able to see the title, genre, rating, director, year, and type of each of the movies loaded at the high level. Now, if I click on one, it takes me to this other view where I can see a little more detail. Now here I can see the poster, I can see the information. I get additional, well, an additional way to do some of the same things like delete or add to collections, but I can also do this edit movie details. And I think this is pretty cool. So if you wanted to say customize the metadata for a movie on your system, if you had a reason to, you could do that. So maybe you wanted to change what genre um, a movie fell under because you wanted it classified or, or showing up in a different way. Most importantly, though, I think, and really the main, main useful type of thing that you might change here, because really for the most part, what you see here is, is really fixed information about the movie. Maybe in some places you'd want to you'd want to maybe edit the title so that you could modify the sort order that something appeared in. That could be a reason that you might want to do this. But one of the things, the, the, the only thing that I've honestly ever modified about the data of a given movie has been its cover art. So you can choose a file and upload uh, changed cover art to the movie. And so if, if some newer movie posters have come out for a film that, or a certain image for a film that you particularly like, that's different from the provided poster art that Kaleidoscape you know, has applied to the movie, you have some capability to change that. And of course, that will propagate through to the on-device UIs and such. But we wanna focus more on the, on, the, on the device versus the content 
and, and some of its operational characteristics here. So the second tab is history. Um, I see some of the same information again that was available on the device itself in terms of the summaries. I have available storage 91 movies in 4K, 168 Blu-ray, 930 SDs. I can also modify the desired maximum download speed here, which I have of course set to unlimited. Um, and then this is a history of my downloads. So it tells me when, uh, when a particular piece of content was downloaded or the title, which, which also serves as a link to that specific piece of content, uh, where it was sourced from, Kaleidoscape store, of course, what type. And then I always find this to be of the most interest to me, the, the status, which is essentially indicating how long did it take to download that movie. Now, I showed some of this in a prior blog, in a prior vlog. So you can see here some of my downloads, what they took. We've got some 4K movies. We just actually watched The Addams Family. And so Adam's family hit an average of 800 megabit per second and completed in nine minutes. That's great. That's basically like the ideal. A 4K movie in less than 10 minutes at that kind of speed is just awesome. Uh, Terminator 2 took 13 minutes at roughly the same speed. It's a bigger movie, right? But then sometimes you get the hiccups. So for, for whatever happened here on March 8th, I was only getting about 258, 188 megabit per second through these couple movies. And you can see that really impacts the download time, right? 38 minutes and 43 minutes. But that's generally the exception. And more often than not, you know, you're getting, you're getting the full bandwidth, uh, the full capabilities of the system when you opt to download. But that's, that's history. So let's go back to settings and let's really kind of get in again to some more of the, the system configuration and the technical aspects of the thing. Let's just keep going left to right. So under general, we have options for system activation. Now, when you, when you set up Kaleidoscape hardware for the first time, generally your dealer will probably do this, but you do have to have a Kaleidoscape account. It's registered against an email address that you're choosing, and, and that's what you log into with the store, how you buy movies, and how you link everything together. And of course, you do have to activate hardware within your account to have everything work um, and function together. So I've, I've did that when I set these items up right away. It's an easy process, really all online. Uh, and when you, you might be removing hardware from your system, if you're changing it, pulling it out, replacing it, selling it, whatever, you can deactivate the items also. And then our software version also represented here, which had been upgraded to this KOS 10.12 on March 3rd. Now there isn't any way to specifically force uh, a, a ping or a check uh, so to speak, for software upgrades, and you don't apply them manually. The devices, as they're, as they're hitting the Kaleidoscape servers, will get notified if an update is available, and then they will auto-update themselves. I, as I understand it, that kind of basically happens every time you use the devices, so it, just through general operation and such, you're going to always stay up to date with uh, the latest available software and features and such. So we can also do some passcode settings here. Again, I don't have a passcode set on my system and haven't felt the need to do so. So components is really where we see the details of the, of the um, items that are available in the system, in the configuration and such. Now I have two pieces of hardware. As stated, I have my Terra movie server, my 12 terabyte, and I have the Stratos e movie player. So they show up here as independent entities, uh, one under the movie server section and one under the movie player section. So we get some like technical monitoring details on the Terra, some information about its available storage, about 52% remaining. We see temperatures nicely in the green and we can control the, the brightness of the front panel lighting from on a scale, well, turning it completely off uh, from one uh, to, <laughs> to bright, which is be the brightest setting. My stuff is in a closet in my rack. It, I just I leave them on because I like to know when I walk in there if stuff is on or off, and I just have them both kind of equitably set to five. Um, we can see here, of course, other pieces of info, serial numbers, IP addresses, MAC addresses, and again, the Strato and the Terra are independently uh, wired on the network, and as, as independent devices, they have their own unique IPs. So let's look at the settings for the Terra first. And what you'll find is there's really not a lot of settings on the Terra. We can control IP address, again, DHCP or static. It's wired only, so there's no Wi-Fi settings. And 
um, some very specific like control protocol um, options and serial port details and such. I don't use any of that. It really, I, the network connection is, is going to probably be the way that that you're using the thing, controlling the thing, interfacing with it and such. And that's really all the settings for the Terra. There's honestly just not much else to configure. It's just the storage. Movies, when you download in the system and you send them to your system, they just they, they know where to go. Everything works itself out. So I think what's really the most of uh, interest here, of course, is the technical settings, the playback settings and such on the actual movie player. So let's go into settings on the Strato C. And uh, we see here we have another kind of tabbed uh, web UI interface with five different options. First one is video. So let's look through here. Um, first, we have more summary information or capabilities. So if I click the show video capabilities and status, this gives me an overview of, of okay, what's connected to the player right now. We can see the main HDMI, the combined audio video HDMI output is active. Nothing else uh, here is connected. Oh, technically, the network one is connected as well. But I'm not using any of the digital audio only, digital audio only ports, uh, nor the USB. We can see here it's registering certain things. My display supports NTSC content at 60 hertz. 30-bit color is supported, um, as well as different color spaces, PAL film modes for 24 hertz and such. So it's basically getting display capabilities. HDMI features, we are enabled here for HDCP 2.2. That's important because if you're not passing the HDCP 2.2 test, then you're not going to get access to your 4K content or you know, all of the playback content available on the system. And we are registering that the current HDMI link supports all these resolution up to 4K, HDR, and 30-bit, basically HDR 10, 10-bit color playback. And then we get bot at the lower part here, HDMI video output status. Right now there's no media playing and it does show us though what the current output is. So we're, we are HDCP 2.2 compliant in the connection and the device basically just sitting on the menu is outputting 4K, 60 Hertz with 444 chroma, 8-bit color, SDR. And so um, if I actually were to start a playback of a movie, I can refresh this. And now we see what's happening uh, with playback. So I just started playback of the first movie that I had available you know, in, in the system, 300, 4K HDR movie. And we can see here, still HDCP 2.2, 4K. Now I've got the switching enabled for 24, or specifically 29, or 23.976 FPS output. We are outputting YUV 420, 10-bit, BT 2020, and HDR. So all the things that you would expect for high quality 4K HDR playback. And again, this is all summary information, some of it static based on the capabilities of the connected display, and some of it, of course, uh, live based on the current activity of the player itself. So let's dismiss that and come back and take a look at some of the other options. So in terms of options, a couple of basic ones and then a few that they put under this advanced video settings dropdown. So the first one, select video output behavior, determines how the player output connects, or de determines how the player outputs content with varying video resolution frame rates, color formats, and so on. So we have a couple options here to minimize display mode changes, allow them, or allow them assuming an external scaler. And if I look at the help, I get a little more of a dropdown telling us here what's going on. Basically, I use the middle setting, allow display mode changes, which means that player will frame rate change to 24 hertz when it's playing 24 FPS content, but the Kaleidoscape will output highest resolution possible, which means the Kaleidoscape will upscale 1080p to 4K or whatnot. I'm not using, in this case, an external scaler. You can also select your preferred resolution for output, and I'm using the highest available at 4K itself. If you go to the last option, we can see here the player outputs video in its native resolution, frame rate, and color format. This setting ignores the HDMI capabilities of display and may use modes not supported, so be careful with that one. Um, screen aspect ratio gives us a couple different options. There is a bunch of default and native support if you're using a scope screen to like re-render the OSD 
and such. And so you have options to be able to control, right, what, what type of presentation you're getting relative to, to your display. And whether you're using lenses and not, right, you want to make the right, the right changing here. So I keep mine to the 16:9 default because I consider my screen or consider that to be kind of the default way that I turn things on. But then I allow um, with Control 4 and different installation modes and triggers that are available in the Kaleidoscape. I do have things change and zoom and such when I play scope content to my scope screen. But I don't have anything really being managed about that in the Kaleidoscape itself versus doing it through control four. And I'll, I'll show that in a, in a more focused detailed video in the future. Fundamentally, I, I kind of could go the other way, probably like using the last option and always leave my, 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 the OSD and the use of the system, like zoomed in and set for scope. And maybe I'll try that sometime just, just to see more often than not, we probably are watching widescreen movies off the kaleidoscape. And so, Having it default to scope would mean it has to change. It doesn't have to change from 16.9 to scope or back, but this is the way that I've generally been using it. If I expand the advanced video settings, we can see a couple other things here. We have options to, to fix the refresh rate for the on-screen display. Um, some folks may like to have that run at a specific uh, setting in order to like minimize the display mode changes in the black screens and such, particularly with projectors that take a while to, to resync and they go black and they come back up potentially many seconds later. So if you wanted to, you could run the OSD at 24 Hertz, knowing that you're probably gonna watch a 24 Hertz movie and then you wouldn't have the extra resynchronization and display mode change time going from the display to starting a movie, but your display navigating around and such may not may not look or feel as fluid as, you know, as if you ran it at 60 FPS. The last one is interesting though. Do not change display mode after playback. Use this setting to reduce display mode changes. This setting may negatively impact the animation of the on-screen display. So I think that that would leave, when you exit a movie and you go back to the UI, it would keep you at whatever refresh rate that piece of content might have been and at least minimize the, the change back there. I have a JVC NX7. The, the sync times, they're, they're not terrible. They're not super great. And, and I don't mind it. I do look forward to getting a, a laser projector or such, something that syncs a lot faster eventually. But in any case, 4K Ultra, Ultra HD support. You can set uh, different levels for the specific bandwidth of your HDMI connection. So automatic default gives you the, the maximum up to essentially 18 gig HDMI, but if for some reason your cables uh, and your setup and your system didn't allow for that, right, that could be fixed down to a lower technical level. Kind of same thing with the HDMI color sampling. I leave that at default, again, with 18 gig HDMI. Different combinations of resolution and refresh rate will force different levels of uh, color output, but I've never had a problem just letting the Kaleidoscape decide on these things. And so I, I leave those on automatic. And then the last one, HDMI content type metadata. When people talk about um, HDMI metadata for like brightness levels and such for the movies and content, this is not that as I understand it. And there's, a, there's really only a very limited subset, a very specific system configuration where you would need this. Um, I'm a little fuzzier on, on, the, on the intricacies of that one, but anything that I've ever scene has suggested that I, I, you don't you don't need it if, if you need it you'd know you'd need it or your dealer particularly uh, would know that you need it second tab audio audio capabilities and status very similar to video so we can see here right what are we getting and you know what what's what's actively being output i don't actually have something plugged into these ports but apparently they are they are active by default again everything's coming out the main hdmi so this is going to look a little funky because it's going to, you're saying, well, stereo, why, why am I getting stereo? Well, I have this playing to my living room zone right now that, that goes into the Anthem and then it's, it's, it's switching it to the zone two output, which is specifically a stereo zone. 
So I am getting basically, as you can see, 192 kilohertz, 24 bit stereo uh, signal down mixing of the Atmos uh, soundtrack that this, that 300 is playing. So you can see it, it's actually feeding or it's getting Dolby Atmos True HD, but it's outputting PCM on the HDMI, basically two channel PCM stereo. Of course, if I was using this with my theater, it would be doing bitstream pass through of the actual signal and I would be getting Dolby Atmos in the theater zone. And that's what's set here by default, select audio output behavior, bitstream pass through. Of course, that's what you would have for a full blown home theater setup. And you do have options to kind of individually come in here and check and uncheck specific codecs and, and types of signals. This will auto detect and kind of set what it understands is capable in the system. And I do appreciate, I really do appreciate that, particularly by running this through the zone, running this through my preamp and having the zone two setup that I have, it, it locks the configuration to what the main zone is capable of. And then the, the down mix, the, the two channel output to the zone two is kind of like taken care of on the fly and it doesn't muck up the settings. So I never have to change anything if using the multi-zone config, it's really quite sweet. So I can go into my theater, play a movie, rest assured I'm getting the Atmos, out, you know, multi-channel Atmos and such audio output down there. I fire this thing up in the living room through the same preamp in the zone two, and I'm getting, you know, I'm getting the two channel that I would expect there as well. Pretty sweet. And then HDMI mode for the second output, automatic, or you can opt for this high bit rate if you want to do basically uh, overriding. I don't use the second HDMI audio output. Um, on the network side, same kind of thing, or, or basically the same types of configurations. Another way to change the IP address, manage DHCP versus static IP. And then one more setting in here, enabled internet settings. This device may connect to the internet to access online content. You can restrict that and disable it if you don't want to. So when you're browsing the interface of the of the system and you're looking at a movie, it might be able to stream you a trailer uh, of that movie. If you have the setting enabled, sometimes we play the trailers and such, and so I have this turned on. Control, a couple things in here. Uh, this control protocol device ID shows up again. CPDID. Some automation and control systems may need that. My control four doesn't. There's some other options for IR uh, code sets. Those are just set to whatever they were by default, as well as uh, some IR remotes use the same pair of buttons for skipping chapters and paging. So you can configure some of the, some of the operational behavior depending on your type of control directly in here. And then the last one, lighting and shades. So not that long ago from recording this, um, some, some months, I, I think, Kaleidoscape announced some, some direct integration and partnership with Lutron in, in order to do lighting control. So if you have one of these Lutron homeworks or, or control systems and you want to be able to link playback and light control in the Kaleidoscape system with Lutron, you can do that. I don't have a Lutron controller. Uh, I use Control 4. My lighting is on Control 4, and that's all done done there. And I will do another video coming up about uh, certain things that I do automate and uh, connect with regards to lighting and screen modes and in the auto, again, like the auto zooming and scope versus 16 by nine, all controlled with Kaleidoscape and Control 4 um, and everything else under that umbrella. So that's the extent of the options, configurations and capabilities that you have access to, of course, on the web UI in a Kaleidoscape system. All right, so that's my overview of the settings, configuration and such of a Kaleidoscape system using my Strato C and the Terra, uh, compact Terra 12 terabyte movie server. If you have any questions about this thing, absolutely please ask in the comments. I can answer and I can incorporate, you know, areas of interest into future videos. There's been a lot of questions from some of my Kaleidoscape coverage already. And I think folks are, are really interested to know more about the platform and its ins and outs and how it works. And so I plan to do quite a bit of uh, both demonstration as well as expressing a lot of uh, opinion and, and preference and recommendation 
and such related to Kaleidoscape in a variety of videos you know, coming on the channel. So if you have questions, ask them in the comments. Please like and subscribe. Look down in the description for ways to support the channel. Particularly, if you're buying a Kaleidoscape, please use my referral code. I can snag a couple of, couple of free movies with the store credit off of it. You can always buy some more Kaleidoscape movies. Take a look at that, and please go ahead and use that. Otherwise, thanks so much for watching. We'll see you soon.